Welcome to another episode of Don't Panic Geocaching, a channel devoted to mystery geocaches. My name is Arjen and I go by waterfan5 on the geocaching.com website. And in this video, I want to tell you more about mystery caches that involve zeros and ones or variations of binary systems like binary codes and Morse code and other systems that use two variants or two symbols or two something, uh, two characters to represent a certain keyword, value, coordinate or something else. Title of this episode, as you can see, it's a bunch of zeros and ones. And in this case, um, it spells don't panic geocacher, but just represents the zero and ones. And today I will help you how to decode codes like this. Now, binary systems are in general just systems that use two symbols. And there's lots of variations of what those two symbols can be. They can be zeros and ones. They could be dashes and dots. They could be A's and B's. They could be holes or no holes. They could be empty or full. They could be bumps. They could be no bumps. They could be apples and pears. Anything basically that has two systems where one is the opposite of the other. Now, this can be used in a lot of different variations and I'm going to talk about some of the more common variations used in geocaching mystery puzzles. Important to understand is that the length of this string that you find, the length of the character range that you find, can be very variable of how many you need to represent a certain character. And I will give you some hints of how this length can actually help you determine the system as well. But first, let's look at some examples that are out there. Here you see a variety of ways where binary systems are used uh, in current puzzles or in history to represent things. So for example, old computers use punch cards where basically the computer did nothing more than to say, is there a hole or is there not a hole? And that represented for the computer something like a zero or a one. But at the end, it was nothing more than just a hole in a card or there isn't a hole in the card. Morse code is actually a variation of the binary system as well. It uses technically, is it a mark or is there not a mark? It also uses how long the mark is, but at the end, if you just measure whether there's mark or not a mark, you basically represent a Morse code. You could say a dot is zero and a dash is one. And now basically you have a sequence of zeros and ones just separated by empty spaces, right? As you see here. But at the end, you just have a sequence of zeros and ones that you could represent. And it's a way to write down Morse code. Braille systems is another way where it's just the bumps and the no bumps to read uh, the code. Of course, you can have spaces in between, but at the end, all of them are represented by six positions. And as long as you understand of how to read the order of the positions, you can represent every Braille character by a zero or a one. Even like exam scores, they know where to look and they know where to read. If it's filled in, it could be a one. If it's not filled in, it's a zero. And so you have certain masks that are being used uh, to interpret and to hide certain combinations and say, now because it's in this position, it represents the A. If it was in this position, it represented the B. And so even though um, it's just a binary system, in combination with something else, it now represents a text or something. Barcode systems, of course, very commonly used for scanning of uh, information. At the end, is nothing more than a series of zeros and ones. If it's a black line, it can be a one. If it's a white line, it's a zero. If you have two right next to each other, it just means one, one, right? Or you can read it as um, how many black lines do you have? How many white lines do you have? And do the zeros and ones that way. Lots of variation with barcodes. But at the end, it's just, there is a line, there is not a black line, that's a zero, that's a one. Of course, traditionally computers use a lot of zeros and ones, and they use what they call so-called word lengths. And zeros and ones within that length of a character now represent a certain value. And I'll explain more about that. 
but it's an other zero and one system where the more it is in to the left or more it is to the right, the value gets higher, the value gets lower, and the computer can do a certain calculation with that and at the end represent a number, a character or something else. Even like if you think about digital TVs, at the end they work with zeros and ones because if you think about this a picture, a black and white picture like this, we can represent something by simply saying zero means it's not filled in, ones means it is filled in. And now we can make a drawing and represent something. And old alarm clocks are another example where you only had seven positions and with those seven positions turning them on and off you represent numbers as you can see here but at the end you can just simply write it as this one is on this one is off the next one is on the next one is off and represent using zeros and ones every information that you see here and at the end it could be as simple as i have apples and i have pears an apple is one the pair is zero or the other way around and now it represents a sequence of zeros and ones what does it mean who knows right that is to find out so these are all variations where it's a binary system, whether it's a hole, whether it's a dash or a dot, whether it's a bump or not a dump, uh, not a bump, filled in or not filled in, a black line, a thin line, a thick line, or a zero and a one, an empty spot or a filled in spot, an LED that's turned on or turned off, or an apple and a pear, also zeros and ones. So now I'm going to use one of my own geocaching puzzles to start explaining and going into some of these different systems and explain some of the more commonly used ones and how they can be represented by zeros and ones and how they can be used to make a puzzle. So here is the puzzle that we're going to use during this video. It's called the 1010 vending machine or really it's the 10 times 1 and 0 vending machine because this puzzle will use 10 variants of binary codes and 10 variations. Um, as usual, this is my own puzzle. So you can see that we're at quarter pen five. And also uh, not a field puzzle. So I always mark that to make sure it's something you can solve from home. So for difficulty, um, of course, after watching this video, it will no longer be a for difficulty. But uh, if you solve it without the video, uh, it's a pretty challenging puzzle because there's a lot of variations that have to be used. Let's take a look. So, uh, of course, cash is not at the posted location. Um, some background story about a store that sells products and each product has a unique five-digit code. This is going to be important. So what we need to do is basically for every element in the vending machine, and they are all pretty cryptic names, you have to find a five digit code and each time the five digit code is solved in some binary variant like ones and zeros so the title will give away um, what or gives a hint to what system is being used and then the code itself at the end will decode to a five digit code so at the end you should have 10 of those so you see here is the next one Barcode of conduct, so little sign, French walrus, uh, a sign of Andy Murray, and all of them have these combinations of ones and zeros at the bottom. An LED alarm clock, a bones grill, DVD pixels movie, a very old home computer, ZX8081, um, an antique ASCII table, I'm not even sure what that is, and a walking stick for the visually impaired. You see all the codes beneath it. Um, now, this one uses a pretty unique um, checker, and I want to show that as well. So if I open that one, uh, the checker actually allows you to enter 10 different answers, one for each one, and it will tell you at the end, um, it will tell you how many you've right and how many you've wrong, and which ones are right and which ones are wrong. So technically, you can solve 9 out of 10, still don't get coordinates, but only when you solve all 10, the checker will give you the coordinates. So quite a unique challenge, uh, challenge checker, but unique and very useful for this style of puzzle. 
So that is it. So that's the puzzle we're going to solve in this video. Um, each one uses a unique way of ones and zeros. Um, and yeah, let's uh, go like, take a look at some theory before we go into the next step. So let's take a look at the most commonly used binary system. And that is the binary code used by computers. This means that computers represent a string or a series of zeros and ones and represent it to a number. That number may then mean something to the computer, where it could mean a character, could be something else, like a piece of code. Now, the way that the computer does that is by knowing the length of the series of zeros and ones that it receives. It then gives every one a twice as high value when it calculates. And you see an example of that below. So here we see an 8-bit uh, number, which is very commonly used um, by systems. And so you see that the first one on the right is worth 1, the next one is worth 2, and each time it doubles, so 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. And now if it's a 1, you basically add that number. If it's a 0, you ignore it. So in this case, it would be 1 plus 2 plus 8 plus 16 plus 128. You add those numbers. And now this string of 1s and zeros represents the number 155. And you can make this as long as you want. And now you can get very big numbers, of course. This is a way of how a computer interprets zeros and ones. It converts it to a number. And of course, if you think about a coordinate, we're all about numbers. So binary codes are very popular in puzzles to represent a specific number. You don't have to necessarily know how to calculate it. There's many tools out there, and I show here a few of them that will do these calculations. So you see three of those tools right here, but there's many more out there on the internet. Note that the length of these, this one is eight characters long, right? A sequence of eight of zeros and ones. But that is just arbitrarily chosen here for this example. Although eight is a very frequently used number, it could be any length. And since as long as I can put zeros in front of it, it doesn't mean anything. The number doesn't get bigger. If I put 10 zeros in front of it, it still would be 155. The length could potentially be flexible. And so if there is spaces in between the different ones, I can have some be eight long, some be six long. And then you just have to imagine that there is leading zeros in front of it to make everything eight long. A special variation of this is that now the computer gives a specific meaning to that number. And so, um, especially in the olden days, but still very commonly used, is the so-called tables of interpretation. An ASCII table was for an 8-bit, was really the first standard that was out there uh, to say, well, if it is this number, then it might mean an A. And you see that, for example, here, that 65 would mean a capital letter A, 66 would mean a capital letter B. And that is one way of how a number could now represent a letter, and therefore a series of numbers could now represent a text, right? And so this is by conversions using an ASCII table. And again, these tools often have that translation in there, that if they see one of those low numbers between 0 and 255, 255 being the highest number you can encode with eight uh, binary digits, that they can then convert it to a number. Typically, you see the values being 32 being the lowest, actually representing a space, and 127 being the highest. In that range, it would typically mean a character. Above that, you get into special characters that are least used. There's all kinds of variation to this, but ASCII is a common variation to say, if I have a series of zeros and ones, it could represent a number, or by looking up that number in the table, it might represent a character. So let's take a look at our puzzle again and see what we can solve with our new knowledge. So we have 10 combinations and some of these uh, can be solved with variants of binary, like the binary that we just learned, right? The binary code used by computers. Now, there is, uh, of course, as you know, this was a specific computer code. 
as I just told you, and one of these displays a home computer. So that is the hint that this code most likely is related to the binary code that we just talked about. So let's take a look. Um, I'm going to use here uh, one of my own tools um, and I'm pasting the code in here and I decode it using the binary decoder and you will see it immediately comes down with a number, right? A five digit number and that is what we needed. Now this tool has some intelligence behind it that it will try to different options so you can actually see all the different variations that it tried and then shows you what I what it thinks is the most logical combination or if it can't decide it just picks the first one. So in this case it's actually a number so we can set the output as number and it's actually just a code that uses all characters in a string so basically uses everything and that is the one that it does. So now we only have the, the one variant it tried. So um, However, so as I mentioned with binary, the length of it actually matters. So for example, if I said, well, this has to be eight um, digit binary, so with eight characters, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we would get this one. And now it would decode to a very different number, right? This decodes to 153, this decodes to 56, and this decodes to one. But in this case, that wasn't the issue. It was just one big 17 bit. And that is the five digit number that we need. So let's try that in the uh, checker. So that we have, as I mentioned, there is a kind of unique geo checker here. For all the ones that I don't know, I just put in once. So, but then when we get to the computer one, we paste in the actual number. Oops, the one behind it. Go on and click submit. And we'll say, of course, it's wrong, but one of the 10 is correct. And that is, of course, the one that we filled in. Now, this is not the only one in this puzzle that uses this binary computer code. There's actually a second one in here. So if we go back to the cache page right here, we also see this one that's called the antique ASCII table. And I mentioned the ASCII table is one of the ways of which characters represented by numbers uh, are form like a letter or form something else. There's multiple of these codes out there, but this is a very uh, popular one used by most computers these days. So this is an uh, eight bit code. So everything is split in eight pieces. And you see here that all the codes have like, are made out of eight. So if we use our tool again and put this code in here and I'll just go again to like try all, we will see if I keep the output to numbers, we will get these numbers, 53, 50, 49, 52, 51. By itself, that's not a five digit code, right? However, if I say I want to interpret this as an ASCII table, so tell me what are these characters on the ASCII table? Now I get five different digits, five, two, one, four, three, because these numbers that I got represent, the first number represented the character five, the second one represented the character two, the next one represented the character one, and so on. And this is for the eight bit binary in the ASCII table. We could also have looked this up in an ASCII table and we would have found that if I decoded this to numbers and I looked up in the table, what is of uh, code 53, then I would have gotten uh, that that would be a five and so on. So we've now two solved. So uh, let's get back and let's take a look at some of the other ones. Another popular system is the so-called Bacon system. Again, this is a binary system, sometimes represented with A's and B's, but if you say an A is zero and a B is one, or vice versa, then you still have a binary system with zeros and ones. So it's named after Lord Bacon. He didn't invent it, but he is a popular name because maybe people just like the name Bacon. But also in puzzles, you may often see this as a hint. You may see some reference to Bacon, and that might now mean that the code that you're going to find is a Bacon cipher. 
just like the ASCII tables that I talked about earlier, every variation is given a representation of a certain character. And there's actually two flavors out there, so there's actually two different tables out there, because each of them only use a five characters. So where we earlier talked with binary that it might be flexible length, with bacon it's always a five sequence of zeros and ones represents a specific character. And so if you have this one, 10101, you can look up in the table and find out that um, this would 10101 would represent an L, while ABBA, you can look that up as well, ABBA, let's see, this one would represent the character P. So this is just all different variations that how a five digit binary system is used to then represent a character and thereby representing a text. As I mentioned, um, there's two flavors out there because in the standard flavor, the U and the V are encoded to the same character. There's another system out there that uses all characters and actually uses uh, the U and the V gives it an individual character. Same with the I and the J. So it's slightly more characters encoded. And so you may have to test two different variations to see if you get a readable text. Again, you don't have to do this by hand. There's many tools out there that will convert a bacon code, whether it's A's and B's or zeros and ones, back to a text. And so you can see where it works. And here there is three links that would do that for you. Now, bacon, uh, and especially how Lord Bacon used, was actually typically used within a specific text and not necessarily as a represent representation of A's and B's, but more as a variation to write a text. And here you see an example of that. So you see here bold and non-bold letters. Every bold letter you could represent as an A or a B and every non-bold letter as an A or again as a B. So depending on what you want to use. And now you could say, well, this is A, B, 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 A, A, B, B, A, B, 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 A. And since you know that it's always five characters, you can now break it into sequences of five characters. And this would give you a code. And you can look up the first one. So 10001, 10001. This one would mean that the first character is an S. And now you can look up the next one. And say okay one zero zero one zero so and you can look up that one in the table and it would be the letter t and so this would now represent a specific hidden word that you couldn't see otherwise but using the bacon methodology you can now decode a different string of text uh, seen series of puzzles using either just the bacon directly or using this combination with either bold characters, italic characters, or some other way to represent a bacon type value. So we just learned about bacon, and in the puzzle itself, there's of course clearly one that indicates bacon, and that is the plate of bacon, right? So if we take this code and we're gonna try that, then we expect the bacon cipher to give us a five digit code. But before I do that, um, let's talk about how it is a little bit different, right? So if we have a five digit code and like uh, all ones, and we convert it using the regular binary system to a number, then we get the number 31. So that means from zero to 31, basically it can, can encode 32 digits, uh, different characters or letters. And that's enough for an alphabet. And that ID is what Bacon is based on. We only need five zeros or ones, or A's and B's, or whatever it is, to get a specific code. So with this tool, it doesn't really matter. So if I say B, 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 you see it still decodes it to the same way. You can actually specify what your characters you want it to be, but uh, all the zeros and ones, A's and B's, it kind of understands that that's just different representations of two character systems. So if we now do 0, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1 in binary into a number, this would be the number 9, right? This is 1, the next one represents 2, 
4 and 8. 1 plus 8 is equals 9. However, if I try this with bacon, then we see that this represents the letter K. Now, I also mentioned that there's two variants of bacon. So we see that here as well. If I uh, look at it, the other style, this would be J. So depending on whether bacon style 1 or bacon style 2 is used, we may get a different output. So now let's try our code that we got and let's decipher that. Let's first show what it would do in binary, right? Let's try that. I'll put it to full detect and we pretty much get garbage, right? It tries to make something from it, um, but as a number, it doesn't work. Maybe this is letters of the alphabet, so it can do that as well. We get these characters or we can try, is it ASCII related? Mm, we still don't get anything very useful, right? We just get numbers. So we're kind of stuck here. So not that, but as I mentioned, this was bacon. So if we try that and we now see that it uh, decodes to something that is humanly readable, right? Two, three, five, six, zero. And here you see something in bacon style one. In bacon style one, the U and the V are actually not individually encoded. So it's the same letter. So clearly we have a five digit code here, two, three, five, zero, uh, six, zero. So two, three, five, six, zero. And we can now try the checker again and see if that is the correct code. So we go back, play the bacon and can try the different, all the other ones I type in just a random number and click submit. Oops, I forgot one. There we go. And we see um, we have the plate of bacon is now correct. We have the check mark. We've correctly decoded this one. So bacon is always five uh, digits. So, um, and we don't even need the spaces, right? If we know that just every five is a different one, you shouldn't really care. It can put basically decodes to the same way, right? But note that we have to check which bacon style it is. So in the other one, it would be uh, Sanji, nothing readable, right? So this is it's bacon style one in this case. As I mentioned, the tool here doesn't also really care whether it's A's or B's. So if we take a part of it, so A, B, B, A, um, B, and so just look at the first letter, then um, you should see an extra, in this case, zero appears because that is how this would convert. But uh, if I did B, A, B, A, so that one is now a B, then you see nicely a T appear, same T here. So it doesn't really care whether it's ones or zeros or Bs or As, um, as long as it's two uh, points and which one is the zero, which one represents the one, you can get a correct decoding right here. So now we have uh, three already solved uh, from the list. We have the uh, ASCII and the binary code, the computer code, and we now also have a bacon variant. I also mentioned typically you have to do a step before with bacon is that is the interpretation of that bold and non-bold characters or cursive and non-cursive characters and represent those two ones and zeros as the first step and then put them through some decoding. That's typically a step you have to do for with bacon, but not necessarily. It might be that the puzzle simply just gives you the ones and zeros or gives you anything that can be converted to ones and zeros. Apples and pears still can be zeros and ones. And I think that's kind of the message of this puzzle. You convert something to zeros and ones, and now you try to figure out how to decode those back to the next step in your puzzle, coordinates or something else, words in this case. So Braille, of course, is a system. It's a tactile writing system so that you feel it with touch for the visually impaired. And every character or sometimes words are encoded with these combinations of a six uh, bumps or no bumps within uh, that symbol. Now, if you represent that a bump means one and no flat means zero, you now have a binary system again of a series of six ones and zeros. 
And so, of course, as long as you know the order how to read them, so for example, I read them by row, the A would be 1, 0, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. Or um, if you want to read it by the column, let's take the B, then it would be 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So you kind of have to know how to read them. So there's always at least two ways. You could even say, well, I start here at the bottom and I read it this way. And now I would get a different sequence number, right? But they're always representable as six digits of ones and zeros. And now they may again represent a character or a number or just Braille code, right? Braille has a system where it can be converted to numbers. The more complicated uh, versions also support words and other characters. But at the end, it is just a series of ones and zeros. At the end, um, if you expect it to be Braille or something related to that, there's again a variety of tools that can help you out there to say, well, I, even though I don't see these characters, but I see a series of zeros and ones that I can convert it back using the Braille system to a text that may give me a number, a value, a coordinate, whatever I'm looking for. So when we look through the different options in our vending machine, and we're looking for one that may support Braille, then there's one that clearly sticks out, the walking stick for the visually impaired, exactly how the Braille language is used as well. So we take these numbers, and you see they're all grouped in pairs of six. And that, of course, has to do with the Braille system that uses uh, six positions where each of them could be a bump or not be a bump, right? So elevated or not elevated. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we know how to read it yet. And I will show you that uh, when we go to our tool. So I'm going here. And if you think how a Braille system is made up, um, then, for example, the letter C has two at the top and then the rest are flat, empty, right? So it's like this. And if I now say uh, for the Braille system, then you see that there is two options here. We can read by row or we can read by column. So if we read by row, then 110011 would work out. Or if we read this, we get indeed the letter C. However, if we read by a column, it would actually be interpreted as this character in the Braille language, which is actually the letter B. And so we could see that as well. So if I get rid of the first one in this equation, so like this. And now we actually see that this is uh, the letter B. And so by column, this would now be the letter K and stuff like that. Because now it actually is this red like this. So there's basically two ways of reading it. So you have to be careful um, and you may have to try both. So if we have our option, then basically the first one could be uh, read by uh, row. And in that case, it would be this. So it is the bottom four that would be uh, colored, like bumped up. Or it could be read by column, where it basically uh, would mean that it is all the ones on the left and all the ones, uh, only the bottom one on the left and all the right column. So we'll just try both here and see what it says. And you see here, if we read by column, it is actually the right way to read it. So we now get a three, uh, five digit number, and that's the five digit number we're looking for. So yeah, think of it that the zeros and ones basically just indicate how the Braille symbol is, what it looks like, right? That's the best way. But at the end, we're still looking at ones and zeros. There's just two variants, whether you read by row or whether you read by column. And that's it. So Morse code is again another example of a binary system, in this case with dots and dashes. The dots and dashes represent, of course, specific letters or specific numbers. And of course, you can make an agreement to say a dot means zero or a dash means one, or the other way around. So unlike some of the other systems like Bacon, which had five characters, or Braille, where we had the six dots, 
Morse codes had variable length. And that's because of characters that were more commonly used, they wanted to represent quicker, and they used the pauses as breaks. Of course, you can represent it again as a series of zeros and ones, and you just have to take a look at the spaces where one character ends and the next character begins. Also be careful here, although international Morse code is the standard, it's not the only one out there, there's many variations out there. You can of course look it up in tables and find out all the characters, but as always there's many online tools that can help you and do the interpretation for you for quicker decoding of a specific test. And just like other systems, could be zeros and ones, could be A's and B's, could be apples and pears, but at the end the methods to get to a text might just be Morse code. So now we're looking for something that represents Morse code. So Morse code has, of course, a variable length, so the spaces uh, can differ from character to character. So that might be something that we'll have to use to recognize it if we don't understand the clue right away. So there's a few of them that we haven't used yet. Barcode, well, that clearly suggests that we barcode. French Walrus, Andy Murray, uh, Alarm Clock, The Grill, The Pixels Movie, and that's it, right? Those are the ones we haven't used. But as you notice, uh, almost all of them have a fixed length, except the Bones Grill one, and also, if we go back, the French Walrus. Now, this is a little trick. If you look up what the French word is for uh, walrus, you actually find the word Morse. So this is actually the Morse code represented. But of course, here again, it could be in two different ways. Is the one a dash or is the one a dot? And so we may get two different uh, answers. And so we may have to try them both and see what is the correct solution for Morse. So um, in this case, we could say, well, um, let's try and see what happens. And we get a solution. And we see that indeed it is the other way around than the system suggests by default, I guess. Um, so here we see that this code actually translates to number 73849. And we have the next answer in our solution. So with this, we always have to see, so what is the N in this case in Morse? And so the N uh, for Morse code is a dash dot. And so in this, case the dash is represented by a one and the dot is represented by a zero but that is just uh, guessing there is no standard for that right we're just representing certain characters but the way that it was variable length is something that's very key if you don't do that with morse code you get a lot of combinations there are some tools out there that can for smaller text like a, a few characters can give you good options of what the potential combinations could be and maybe using a dictionary help you solve it but typically you do need the spaces in between the different segments words uh, to come back and figure out where does a letter begin and where does a letter end where with some of the other ones that we discussed like the braille always six characters uh, the 8-bit binary well always 8-bit like the ascii table the bacon cipher was five uh, characters, five zeros and ones. But with this one, the space is a very key, but it also might help us identify it. LED segments are another popular way for puzzles to trick you into something that maybe looks like another binary code, maybe looks like Morse code, looks like binary, looks like Morse, but actually is its own system to represent this value. It's often harder to recognize because it uh, kind of like draws a letter. There is not a consistent way of getting to a number or getting to a value. And so you kind of have to look at it as, is the LED turned on, is the LED turned off, and kind of draw the letter out, as you see here in the examples to the right. Two common variations have either seven or 14 segments. So represent a string or a length of your character of seven zeros and ones, 
or 14 zero sum ones. But other systems exist. I've seen them out there that use 8, 10, 12 uh, segments of to represent. Also, the order, of course, is not defined. So in this case, you say, well, the first one is A, then this one is B, then this one is C, then this one is D. But that's a no, fixed system, right? It could be this one is A, this one is the next one, this one is the next one, and so on. So the order doesn't have to be the order as is displayed here. It can be very flexible. But typically, it would be either 7 or 14, and that might help you recognize these LED systems. And of course, a three, for example, means that A is on, B is on, C is on, D is on, but E is off, F is off, and then G is back on again. So you would get one, 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 zero, zero, one, right? And now you would have drawn a three. And so that is how you have to look at it. And again, there's tools out there that can help you decode for you if you then enter these values. Note, of course, if you think about a two-step uh, value, they could give you the number 155. You have to go back to binary, maybe using one of the other codes, back to a series of ones and zeros, and now back in LED to draw it back into a digit. So it can be quite tricky, but I've seen many puzzles using the LED segment out there to represent numbers, because, of course, numbers can be coordinates. Going through the list, it's pretty obvious to see which one would be the LED display, right? There's a clock right here, it even says model seven, hinting that we have the seven segments. And here we see everything divided in pieces of seven. Now the problem, however, is what is the first one? Is that the top um, LED? Is that the bottom LED? Is that the left one, the right one? And so sometimes you may have to reorder them to uh, get them into the right display that you need them. So if you're convinced that LED is the right answer, it doesn't necessarily mean that all these are in the right order. And you may get something that doesn't look like a number at all, but still may often give enough away that you see, hey, these are the same, and this is where I maybe expect the same number, so that you're still on the right track with the LED's display. So one of the tools out there that can do this is the uh, Decode website. And in this case, if I put the numbers in there and hit the decrypt option, we see that it automatically kind of displays as a um, number, five digit number that we're looking for. And that is, if you think about the four, then uh, the way that they were ordered, it's basically four segments need to be on. And you see four segments are on in this case. Uh, for the three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So, um, of course, they also need to be in the right locations, right? So if I swap them around uh, somehow for this one, then um, try to decode it. You see, it doesn't look like a number. It actually looks, in this case, like a J. So it's very important that you understand and that you may have to experiment with the order of how the bits need to be. But then all of them should follow the same pattern, right? Once you have figured out the pattern for one, like, hey, if I put them in this, it will draw the number that I need, then all the other ones will have the segments in the right order. So this is another variant of how zero and ones can lead you to a number. We just looked at LED segments before, and basically a more complicated variant of that is where you use a pixel system, where you say each pixel, each block, is either white or black filled in or empty. And so now you get a series of ones and zeros. Of course, you have to again think about the direction. Do I go by row? Do I go by column? How do I read this? But at the end, if I say zero, one, 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 zero, 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 one, zero, one, 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 I kind of can draw a picture out. And for example, the old bitmap format did exactly that. This was a bitmap where it just told you exactly what are the zeros, what are the ones. Zero means blank, one means it's filled in. And now I have a two color drawing. And of course, if you do that, if you get a long series of zeros and ones, 
we can draw out a certain character, a certain symbol, a word, letters, anything we wanted that of course could represent a coordinate, a solution that we have to. It's very inefficient, of course, because we need lots of zeros and ones to just talk about the character A, but it could also be a QR code that we draw. It could be something else. So at the end, the zeros and ones could just be a picture that we can now use to do a next step in a puzzle. So yeah, one of these is uh, represented by pixels. So let's take a look. Already done quite a few, of course. And one of them makes a reference to the movie Pixels. So pretty straightforward that we're talking here about a pixel drawing here. So we'll take the text. Going to use a German website. And I'm just going to use the Google Translate feature to just make it into English. There we go. So now it's English. And uh, the way that this one works is it detects automatically by spaces um, what it should be. So if we do it like this, uh, we copy the text across and we say encode. We see it drawing the actual characters. We could actually visualize it a little bit if we just uh, put it nicely as lines underneath each other. You can almost see the answers, right? You can see here the eight being formed. You can see here the four being formed. You can see here a zero, then five and five. The ones basically represent the dark space. Now you may not always be as lucky that you have the correct information, right? That you have the uh, exact spaces because it may just be represented like a single stream of zeros and ones like this, right? And now if you press encode, you get, of course, a very long line. Well, the tools allows you to kind of like uh, specify your own length. So let's say that we think it's uh, uh, 30 or, no, let's start with a small number, 15 by, well, let's just take a 15. And so now we see it here. But this is a typical pattern that you could expect if you expect something to be drawn. You see like this lines of black uh, in the output, right? So you know, okay, maybe I'm not at the right length, but I'm at the right ID, right? So if we do maybe 12, now it looks a little bit more garbled. Um, but still you see these like almost recurring patterns coming back, knowing that one of these numbers is the correct one. And if we go to 19, then we actually see it was 19 characters per line. So you may have to experiment a little bit if there is not clear spaces in there to indicate where the lines begin and end. But other than that, um, even if you're on the wrong track, you often can see by some of the patterns in the output that you're making something special. Um, so yeah, that is a, an example of pixel art. Of course, in this case, it's a five digit number. In other cases, it might be coordinates. We've also seen QR codes. The output could be anything like but all decoded as ones and zeros. Earlier, we talked about how a combination of zeros and ones represent like a certain picture. Well, what if the picture is just holes in an image and only the holes are important? That is what typically a mask or a grill is. So here you see a variation of that. And this is actually a specific variation called the garden grill, which is slightly more complicated and goes out of the scope. But the idea is very simple. If I have a certain text, then I just only use where the holes are and everything where there is not a hole, I kind of ignore. Or vice versa. I use where the black text is and I kind of ignore where the holes are. So if you look at a specific text, then you can say, well, since the holes are here, I only use the characters that are in the holes. And you see here that if this is my total segment, then this one is the D, so in this case, if the holes are here, then my text is drawn, right? D-A-W-N, because that's where my holes are. And here I can put uh, the word, so for example, S-K-A-T, because that's where my holes are, and so on. The cardigan grill does a little bit more complicated than this, but at the end, it's all about what is visible, what is not visible, and then what am I going to use? Unlike some of the other systems, this cannot stand by itself. It needs something else. So here, just having the zeros and ones that now make my mask, 
I need a text to go with it to now make a word value. So this is often something similar like, for example, book ciphers, where you need a certain zeros and ones, and you need a text that kind of matches it. So as you see here, to get to a final text. But a very efficient way to hide something in a long text to say, only uh, look at this and ignore everything else. And the zeros and ones now represent what to ignore and what to look at. Okay, so masks and grills can be pretty tricky to recognize since it's related to something else and that something else may be on the cache page, may not be on the cache page. So uh, in this case, there is of course one that's clearly marked grill cipher, but that only helps because you're watching this video, right? Other than that, you would have to recognize that there is something going on here where we have to use a grill or a mask variant. So this is one that people have been struggling with um, when they look at this puzzle. And I can see that because of the checker. Um, but there was another hint in here that may have been useful. So if you look at the pattern of the zeros and ones, there's actually a, the length is of course variable. Well, we saw Morse code and some other systems may use variable length, but with grill ciphers, you can do that as well because they have to match what they are mapping to. And so here, the text above, bones, is five. This is five. Grill is five. This is five. X is two. And this is two. And then there's a five digit number. And there's a five digit zero and one combination. So the mask that's being used here is that only the ones that have the one is the ones we keep. And the ones with the zero is the ones in this case we black out. So we don't use the B, we use three letters in a row. One, and then we use the S, okay, S, we're zero, zero, so we don't using these. Next one is an I, S, I, the next two we don't use, L. The first one here we don't use, and X. So we get S, I, X, one, six. We now have two digits, right? And we need three more. And you see the last three is the first two of this, two that we don't use, and then this one. So two, one, five. So the answer is becomes one, six, two, one, five, where we basically used the zeros and one to explain what should be masked out or what should be grilled. So this is a simple variant. There's more complicated variants like the card and grill that I explained that involves rotating across the same grill. It's more standardized. But it is this very simple techniques where basically say, ignore this, use that using the zero and ones. Earlier on, we looked at ASCII tables as part of a binary and a computer system. But before that, telegraphs used a similar system only with five digits. And there was multiple variants of that called Murray, Bodot, or ITA2 that all are tables where it says, well, if I have a certain combination of zeros and ones, it means a certain character. We saw a similar system being used by Bacon. We saw, of course, binary and ASCII tables using that with eight zeros. But all these variants that were used by telegraph systems actually used a five character system, where it was a five saying, Z one one zero 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 and now I would have for example an A while one one zero one zero would represent a B. So there's a variety of tables out there. Uh, Murray, Bodot, ITA are just some of the examples. All of them use kind of like a five character series of zeros and ones to kind of say what character is it and now you can of course spell words, spell numbers. Uh, you can find these tables anywhere. Here are the, some of the tables that you can find online on the Cache Sleuth website or the Decode website. But again, there's many other characters out there because these were official standards used in communication in the past to transport information across. And of course, just can be represented by zeros and ones. And so if you see the zeros and ones, could be Bacon, could be Morse, could be ITA, could be something else. It is just one of the many options you have. 
um, Bodot and Murray are two, as it was mentioned, old telegraph uh, systems to spell the alphabet, again using zeros and ones, dots and empty combination. So just like bacon, it's also a combination of five. So it's almost like a bacon variant that you can think of. But it's slightly more complicated because just like Morse, there is an uh, option to say I'm going to letters or I'm going to non-letters like numbers or characters, thereby encoding more with the same five digits. So where Bacon only uses the same uh, ones all the time, this one can also switch between numbers and letters based on a character sent before. So that's something to take into account. Uh, Fortunately, there's online translators. So when we uh, take this text, and in this case, I'm going to use the, the French decode website, um, put the numbers in here and say decode it, and it will try all the logical combinations that exist because there's all kinds of variants to it. As I mentioned, Bodot, ITA1, ITA2, Murray, but you see that indeed the Murray variant will give us a five digit number. The arrow indicates that we're going to numbers and then it is a five digit number. And that's the number that we need here and we've yet another one solved in this scenario. Where the hint of course was Andy Murray, the tennis player. One more to talk about, barcodes. As I mentioned earlier, barcodes are simply just a combination of ones and zeros where for each space you either say it's filled in, it's a black line, it's not filled in, it's a white line. And if you have two, a thicker white line, it's just more ones next to each other. So this is a long combination of just zeros and ones, and that's at the end how a scanner reads it. It doesn't read thin lines and thick lines, it just reads, is it filled in, is it not filled in, where are my spaces? And at the end, that's the code that it reads. Many variations exist of barcodes and more complicated variations exist like QR codes, which is just a multiple row variant of a barcode, where instead of one lines of zeros and ones, it's multiple lines of zeros and ones. But if you see zeros and ones, it might be that you have to draw it out like a barcode. And now the barcode you can scan, and then hopefully you have the right barcode format. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of variations of barcodes out there. There's at least 20 official recognized standards and many, many more variations out there. There's a variety of tools out there, but one of the tools of the decode website actually allows you to just to draw out the barcode from zeros and ones. So you feed it the zero and ones, it will draw the barcode. And now maybe you can use another tool to scan the barcode and find out what it is. So again, another example of where zeros and ones can represent something that is not binary, that is not Norse, that is not Braille, that is not ETA, but still is a text or potentially a coordinate. So the last one on the list is the one that already in the name says barcode of conducts and has the hint barcode in there. It's actually another in here, which is the 39, and this has to do with that there is many different barcode systems. Now, I mentioned uh, barcodes is basically a combination of zeros and ones, right? The line is a one, and the white space is a zero. So we can actually draw this out, and the French website uh, Decode has a nice little tool for that. So if I put it, the zeros and ones in here, it will actually draw out what the barcode would look like. And so even if you don't know what it is, you can now visualize the barcode and maybe use another tool on your phone or maybe on the computer to describe what it is. Now, in this case, we know it is a code nine barcode, so they have a special tool for that. And we can go there and we can put in the zeros and ones directly in here. And if we see decrypt, um, it will actually just decode it. It doesn't even go through the immediate step, intermediate step to make a barcode out of it. It just says, this is a barcode that gives us this five digit number. And now we have the last one solved of the sequence. So yeah, um, barcodes can be tricky because there's many different variations. This is only a few of them, but it can help a lot if you can at least generate a barcode. 
because then you can maybe use other websites and other tools to figure out which one is it. So we have seen many examples of zeros and ones. How do we find out which one is used? Unfortunately, unless there is clear hints in the text, for example, a reference to the word bacon, a reference to Morse, like the inventor of Morse is often a popular way to say uh, that Morse code is being used, or maybe there's something with Braille or something that refers to an LED screen. If not, then you have to guess and try them all, right? But there is a few hints, especially if you see spaces in the text. Bacon, we know it's always series of fives. So does it break off in five? Well, bacon is a good variant. Murray is also a good variant. Is it broken off in pieces of six? Then Brill might be a good variant. Is it seven or 14? LED has that very specific number. And so on. Do you see variable length? It might be Morse code. Do you see a very, very long text? Might be that it is a drawing, like the black and white drawing. So the length of the characters may give you a hint. And sometimes it might be a multiple of that, right? So you see, for example, well, it's 65. Well, 65 is dividable by 5, might be 13 characters. 13 digits is often a coordinate, so bacon might be the correct number. While 30, uh, 65 is not dividable by 8, so maybe it is not binary, right? It's not dividable by 6, maybe it's not Braille. It's not dividable by 7, so it may probably not LED. So you have to look at the amount of zeros and ones that you have, and that may give you a value. Could be a drawing, so 65 um, divided by maybe 5 by 15, right? And um, that's not correct. Uh, uh, 5 by 13 is now your drawing size. And so, therefore, it could be a drawing for 5 pixels wide and 13 in length, and that might be the drawing size. Very small, so it could maybe represent one, two characters, so it doesn't seem to be likely. But if it's many more, then maybe it is a drawing, right? So length is one way to find out what is used. If that doesn't work, yeah, you would have to go through the usual suspects. And I would like to tell you that these 10 that I described here is all that is used. Unfortunately, it's not. There's many other ways that I've seen being used in puzzles. But at least if you go through these sets, there's a lot of puzzles that will use these because these are the 10 most common ones that I have seen. And variations of these may exist, but hopefully the patterns that you will see will kind of put you in the right direction of what code it could be. So that was the end of the episode about zeros and ones. Please like this episode if you thought it was valuable and please subscribe if you'd like to be notified of future videos that I will be releasing. If you have a comment, feel free to use the comment section of the YouTube to leave a note, or you can contact me at waterfan5 on the geocaching.com website, or email me at geocacher.waterfan5 at gmail.com. With that, I hope this was useful, and maybe next time you see a mystery cache, you don't have to panic as much. Thank you very much.